and only mode. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar presentation using cognitive behavior therapy techniques with individuals with autism spectrum disorders. Today's presentation will be presented by Michelle Antle. She is a KTC field trainer. Feel free to ask questions or make comments at any point throughout the presentation by typing your question in the question box and clicking send. If you cannot see the question box, click on the orange box with the white arrow in the upper right corner of your screen to open the question box area. And Michelle will be answering questions you submit at the end of the presentation today. Michelle Antle completed her undergraduate degree at Kentucky Wesleyan College in Owensboro, Kentucky, and her EDS degree in the field of school psychology. In 2011, Michelle was recognized for her hard work and dedication and was named Kentucky School Psychologist of the Year. Michelle worked as a school psychologist in public schools for 11 years and also has experience in the mental health field as she served as the Autism Coordinator for Family Options, Inc. and worked for children and families through the Impact Plus program. In her current role here at KATC, Michelle provides direct training and technical assistance to education staff, social and community personnel, counselors, job coaches, and family. So without further ado, I'd like to turn my screen over today to our presenter, Michelle Ansel. Good morning, everyone. That was a nice introduction from Dee, so I really appreciate that. Um, this morning, a lot of the examples as I walk through, um, I've tried to include a variety, so home, community, and school, just so that you can get a better understanding. Um, some of the things we're going to be talking about today are making sure that we understand the definition of what we call cognitive behavioral intervention. Um, this is a new research-based practice um, that we have, that has now been listed um, and considered evidence-based. So we'll hopefully dive in deep to that so that you'll understand some of the strengths and maybe some limitations to using some of these strategies, talking about the kids or individuals that might benefit both, most from those. I'm also going to show you several different examples with some strategies and how to use those. Um, and also, I want to recognize that even though this particular topic focuses on kids with AD, or I'm sorry, with autism, they can also be very helpful with other children with other diagnoses, such as autism, uh, or I'm sorry, ADHD, anxiety disorders, and we'll talk a little bit more about that also. Um, just because I wanted to add a little bit more meat to the presentation, you may see some additional examples that I've added to the presentation that weren't included in the initial email that Dee sent out to you all yesterday. Um, I will be citing these sources as to where they come from. A few of them are actually um, field examples in which I obtained parental permission to include so that I could share those with you all. But if you have further questions, please definitely let me know. Um, as always at KATC, we are always trying to look for new and cheap or free resources that we can share with families and professionals because we know with budget limitations these days, things can be kind of tight. So just wanted to give the disclaimer up front that even though I will be referencing several resources, it's not that I'm necessarily behind or promoting those products in any way or those websites or resources. It's just that, again, those are resources that could be easily obtained um, by parents. And so I'm all about making sure that we pass on that information. So to get started this morning, really wanted to talk about what cognitive behavioral intervention looks like. And yes, it was one of those new 27 evidence-based practices that came out in the 2014 report this summer by the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders. And what the National Professional Development Center does is analyze all of the research or most of the research that they come in contact with that really emphasize and point out 
what, you know, for example, in this situation, cognitive behavioral interventions are supposed to do. And in order for it to be considered evidence-based, it has to be able to be replicated, um, have a fi fine degree of fidelity, making sure that it's able to be copied or replicated by not just one company or education um, standard, by numer but by numerous people in several different environments. So if you have questions, about that report or how they became um, how they came to add that to the list, please feel free to just Google the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders, and you'll be able to pull up that report and find out more information about that. Um, cognitive behavioral intervention um, is based on the belief that behavior is mediated or controlled by cognitive processes. And we're going to talk more about that. So if you hear me say cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral intervention, just know that I'm using those two terminologies um, um, in conjunction with one another. It's not two separate things. I may just reference that together as one. Within this model, learners are taught to examine their own thoughts and emotions. And by doing that, we hope to recognize and teach them that when their negative thoughts or emotions take over, that sometimes they don't make the best choices. And sometimes we need to formally teach them, especially in the situation with kids with autism, what specific replacement behavior that they need to utilize instead of the negative thought process or the negative behaviors or emotions that they, they have as well. So ultimately, this strategy is going to be designed for them to recognize their thoughts and emotions, recognize that that's maybe not the best way, and then teach them a more appropriate strategy to change their thinking and thus will hopefully change their behavior. This particular intervention tends to be used with learners who display a lot of problem behaviors. It may be definitely related to their emotions or feelings, but most specifically we see this in terms of anxiety and anger. So they're often also used in conjunction with other evidence-based practices that you might encounter on that list. So social narratives, um, pairing that with reinforcement, and then also parent-implemented interventions. Because as you will see, cognitive-based interventions have to occur all the time, not just within the confines of a particular therapy session. You have to really focus and practice that in everyday living in order for these strategies to be effective. So one of the big talking points is about what age range is good to use cognitive behavioral intervention with. And if you look at the evidence-based studies that are referenced in that report, the intervention has been shown to be effective for elementary and school age learners, specifically for ages 6 to 11, and then all the way up to high school and adult learners. So up to 18 years of age is where the studies actually stopped. Now when we look outside of the realm um, of these research-based strategies, I can tell you from my own personal experience and the personal experience of the families that I work with that some of these strategies, if they're altered in a certain way, um, you are able to use them with children that are much younger, um, even all the way down to preschool age children. Also, we know that this strategy is effective for um, adults um, with a multitude of disabilities. So just kind of keep that in mind as we walk through um, this information. Now, it definitely is effective in addressing um, areas of social and communication as well as behavioral um, and improving their independence and ability to function um, in their own worlds without adults present. And then very obviously it has positive mental health outcomes as well. So getting into more about what cognitive behavior therapy is, um, it's been around for a really long time. Um, if you get on and research cognitive behavior therapy, you'll see that it, it dates back um, quite a bit. And typically it's been used and identified as an appropriate strategy for individuals diagnosed with anxiety, depression, those that have anger management issues. But if you look through the research and also talk to practitioners, they'll tell you that it's really good also with people that have mood disorders, um, anxiety disorders specifically, but personality disorders, and sometimes those that have altered thinking patterns. 
Um, it's been used in eating disorders uh, clinics and inpatient facilities um, as well. Substance abuse, sleep disorders, psychotic disorders. Um, they've also tried this even with individuals with schizophrenia. So that's referenced also. And the most important thing to remember is that this type of therapy really focuses on the relationship that, ex that exists between your thoughts and your feelings and then your outcomes or your behaviors. So how the internal things really drive the external things and behaviors in our life. You'll see it referred to as an active intervention and what that means is is that you can't be passive and just kind of sit and listen to someone. You have to be an active participant in your own intervention because if you're not going to work at it and practice what it is that you're being taught in those sessions outside of your therapy sessions, then you're not going to get any better at it. So you've really got to be committed and sometimes that's a hurdle that we have to jump through especially when we're targeting young kids because they really don't see the need or the benefit or have the motivation to want to do that on their own. And a lot of this you'll notice the citations at the bottom. Um, the National Association of Cognitive Behavioral Therapists, they do have a lot of wonderful information um, on their websites and some resources, some lists of providers in your area that you might be able to find, locate either um, that would be on your insurance panels or um, available in your community. So the big question has been, how is this going to work with individuals with autism? Because we know that their cognitive processes um, are changed and altered. So I want to spend some time talking about what is it that we know about individuals with autism and how this is going to directly relate to the types of strategies that we use with them. So we know that they're very literal and they're concrete thinkers, so it's very black and white. So therefore, we need to have very specific goal-driven um, and goal-oriented types of um, objectives on our treatment plans. We know that they're very detail-oriented, so making sure that we really think through some of these interventions before trying them with our individuals. We know that they're visual learners, so making sure that we can make these concepts that are very abstract usually in nature to be very visually visually appealing to them and also so that they can comprehend them better because we do know that they struggle with comprehension sometimes. Also the difficulty with problem solving. So getting from point A to point B to point C and then down on the list. So sometimes taking in the larger picture and understanding where we're going at the end of the road um, is difficult for them. And so we have to break it down in a way that's going to be more meaningful. And we also know that they struggle with generalization problems. So understanding that if I learn a coping skill in this particular setting, let's say at home, that that same skill or a coping skill is going to help them um, in the community setting or at school setting. So understanding that just because I learn it in one environment doesn't mean that it's not going to be effective in another. Something that I declined to put on this slide that I think it's important to mention is difficulty with executive functioning. And executive functioning has to do, um, in a nutshell, with the storage and retrieval of information in your brain. So if you want to think of your brain as a large filing cabinet or a large file room, um, in our file rooms we typically have cabinets and those cabinets are clearly labeled. So if I were to say, tell me some colors, you know exactly where to go in that file room, in that drawer, and you open it up and neatly organized in that drawer is red, yellow, green, blue, orange, etc. So sometimes with executive functioning, um, you have difficulties being able to find that in that file room. So it may be that you know the information is there, but just readily being able to access that information in a timely manner is very difficult. And we all know that when we're kind of frustrated or we're agitated and we're trying to find information, that we become even more upset with ourselves and we don't problem solve well. So being able to keep that in the back of our mind, that knowing that those executive problems functioning problems exist um, and keeping that in the forefront of acknowledging that when we work through some of these strategies. Michelle? So, yes. Can I interject a little? We can't see your slides. Do you have a, a show my screen button on oh, your panel? No. I, was I was looking at, I apologize, it may be something new with the software. Let me see. 
There we go. Now, is that better? It is better. Thank you. I thought I'm so sorry. I apologize. I thought it was something on my end. They changed the software, everyone. Okay, that's great. Thank okay. you. <laughs> well, hopefully everybody's, I've kind of been talking off the slide a little bit anyway, so hopefully everybody's been able to keep on top of it. Um, I'll definitely go back and, and hit that again um, if need be. So when we really start talking about the strengths of cognitive behavioral therapy, some of the things that jump out at us are that it's very instructive. Um, it's very goal-oriented, so you start with an end goal in mind, and then you kind of task analyze or break that goal into smaller parts and make them more smaller or obtainable goals and recognize, okay, I've got to treat this part first before I'm able to move on to this part. So it is very instructive in terms of you're going to have a very specific plan. Um, it is considered to be a shorter term type of strategy, meaning that you can definitely get in there because it's so goal focused um, and have a shorter term or longer term um, focus as needed. It is very structured because it's very concrete. So very obviously you can see that that would go with our learners very well when you consider autism. Um, it definitely can be researched. There's a ton of research out there to support it. Like I said, it's been around for a really long time. And the most important strength in my mind is that it can be adapted to any individual. Um, you know, you try a strategy, it doesn't work. You can easily change that. Um, with some other types of therapies, it's not quite that easy. Um, the structure definitely has to be there in order to be able to say, you know, I'm doing XYZ type of therapy. And that's not how it works with cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's a good thing for us, especially with our kids with autism. So what are some of the limitations? The biggest thing that we already talked about is needing to commit yourself, you know, to being able to really analyzing your own um, thoughts and emotions and therefore making a long-term change. So as a therapist or what I call an interventionist, we can help them and advise them as much as we can, um, but we just can't make their problems go away. So it kind of goes with that saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Um, it's really important that they participate in those sessions, you know, not just sit there and listen to what a person has to say, but really have the motivation also to want to do those things. Because again, it's going to require a lot of extra work in between those sessions and applying it, you know, in a multitude of environments, not just within the confines of the four walls of a therapy room. Um, also, it can be uncomfortable um, for learners. You know, you kind of have to be willing to step outside the box and think about those uncomfortable feelings or anxieties or emotions or maybe, you know, get down at some of the weaknesses that you have. And that's uncomfortable to all of us. And especially when you get started in the beginning, you know, that's, that's very uncomfortable. And you might have times where you feel even more anxious or more uncomfortable than you would in the situation that's causing you grief to begin with. And so really getting individuals to understand that that's okay and that's part of the process and that's only going to be short-lived and that one of the ways um, to best get through that is to actually work through that um, with your coach or your interventionist or your therapist or whatever it is that you want to call them. So again, it focuses on that individual's capacity to change themselves. And with some of our kids with autism, they don't want to change because their behaviors are working just fine for them. So that can be a pretty big hurdle to overcome. And um, for those of us who have worked with individuals with autism, they're very set in their ways. And sometimes um, because they're so concrete, it's very difficult to sway them or get them to see our point of view. Um, so when you think about, you know, for example, I worked with um, an individual recently and very clear-cut signs, you know, adult, a young adult with autism, very clear-cut signs that he probably was more on the high-functioning Asperger end. And when we finally, you know, had the discussion of, well, have you ever heard of Asperger's? He said, oh, that's not what I have. So we kind of whipped out the um, eligibility criteria or the characteristics, if you will, and without being labeled um, an autism spectrum, kind of just went through those characteristics and said, do you feel like you have this? Yes or no. Do you feel like you have this? Yes or no. And by the end of the conversation, lo and behold, he had most of the characteristics checked on the page. So 
by then being able to kind of approach it from that, that aspect of things, um, he seemed a little bit more willing to consider that he might have more of those characteristics than he had initially thought in the conversation. So I say all that to say that sometimes, um, you know, a lot of time needs to be spent just building rapport with that individual and convincing them that we're not going to change who you are or how you think or what you do for the negative to manipulate you or change you in a bad way, but these things are going to be able to help you um, to work through some of those difficulties that you might have or those characteristics that sometimes we don't recognize in ourselves. The other thing I want to mention is that with these types of interventions, it is very individual focused. So a lot of times we work really closely with families or teams of individuals or staff members within a school, and they say, well, this is really great and good for the kid, but how is what you're telling me going to help me in dealing with that individual? So hopefully a little later I'm going to show you some examples that will help you do that in a more effective way. So some other considerations that I want you to think about um, because of the type of work that we're asking them to do with these cognitive behavioral interventions, you know, specifically examining your own thoughts and emotions, that's a pretty higher level skill. So really keeping in mind, you know, what is that individual's functioning level? And not necessarily based on your cognitive skills, but are they able to follow directions and understand the language that you're using and really be able to comprehend what it is that you're trying to explain or get across? Something else to consider is the age or developmental level of the person. We know that obviously young children um, don't developmentally have the ability to kind of step back and take the perspective of going, oh yeah, that's kind of what, I see what you're talking about. They are the center of their own universe and sometimes don't realize that thinking outside the box um, really involves, you know, doing just that and analyzing things on a deeper level. It's very surface level types of thinking. So keeping that in mind also. Um, and again, the willingness to change their behavior and then the motivation to do that. Again, if we're not motivated to change, then we really probably aren't going to be likely to put in a lot of time and effort that this type of intervention is going to take. So you may have to build in some other reinforcements or supports to make it um, purposeful or meaningful for them in another way until they can kind of see some success on their own. So I'm going to take some time to walk through some examples of the cognitive-based intervention, um, specifically that we might use with students with ASD. And one of those interventions that we've that is also listed as a separate evidence-based practice on our list is social narratives. And if you want a ton more information about this, we have done webinars in the past. Most recently, Laura Ferguson did a webinar on social narratives, and it was excellent. So you can definitely go back on our YouTube channel and watch that um, and get more information. But I'm going to just kind of summarize it for you. Um, social narratives. Um, are just simply short stories that define a social situation. You're going to want to use child-friendly vocabulary that they're going to understand and making sure to present situations um, to the child that can be meet more easily understood. So making sure that you consider not only their language, but maybe pairing that with visual supports in terms of pictures of them doing the activity or pictures of the environment in which um, those behaviors may occur. And the most important thing about a social narrative is that it's going to provide a more appropriate response for them. So if they're currently engaging in a negative behavior in a certain situation, then we're going to teach them a more positive behavior and kind of outline when and how to do that. And another key component here is that it's preventative. This is a preventative or an antecedent-based intervention, meaning that we're not going to wait until the behavior occurs, but we're going to think about how we're going to implement this before as a preventative measure. So before that behavior becomes a tantrum, we're going to give them the skills that they need to walk through that. Carol Gray is a big name um, under the, the heading of social narratives, and she actually coined and marketed the term social story, so you definitely can research her a little bit more. And she describes the social story as a process that results in a product. So if you think about that, that really fits nicely with the cognitive behavioral intervention definition. You examine your thoughts, which is a process, and that results in a product, or for our needs to be to change a behavior. 
So a process, meaning a better social understanding and a consideration of the kid's perspective. And then a product means that we're going to define that situation or concept or give them a social skill that's going to ultimately change the behavior that they're exhibiting currently. So one of the most important things that we talked about earlier with cognitive-based interventions is having a goal. So picturing that goal at the end and knowing exactly where it is that we want to go with that. So we want to make sure that we share that relevant social information with them, use as many visual or concrete references as we possibly can in order to ab explain those abstract concepts that come about. So again, the goal is to change the response of the kid by giving a more appropriate response and teaching them about that by also doing that in a way that they can understand better. So here's a quick example of a social narrative. Many kids like to spend time with their mom and friends. They like it when I talk to them using my words instead of my hands. When I'm with my mom or my friends, I'll try to keep my hands to myself and use my space ruler. And a space ruler, if you notice, is that key vocabulary that we noticed that we had used with the child in, the pre in previous um, interactions and that he understood and worked well for him, so it was included in the story. When I want them to look at me, I will try to say, excuse me, this is a good idea. My friends and my mom like it when I give them their space and use my words. So again, we're examining our thoughts and our actions and then giving them a replacement behavior in order to retrain um, or replace the negative behavior, in this case maybe talking with your hands instead of your words. And again, there's definitely more rules that go with social narratives, so I would encourage you to research that a little bit more. The other, um, I guess, resource that I wanted to share with you that has some great ideas is AutismTeachingStrategies.com. And again, I want to emphasize that we are not behind this particular company in any way or website. It just, again, is a great place to go that has a ton of resources that you might be able to use. And if you're like me, unfortunately, we don't have an unending amount of time to sit and research and design our own it, um, types of interventions, and so sometimes just to kind of see what other people have done to help jog our memory or to figure out different ways that what we've already got in place might be more effective, um, I'm all about that. So I'm definitely about sharing that with you. So this website is particularly good and has some great strategies. So I'm going to kind of walk through some of these, what these strategies are and how that might apply to some of you all. Um, you know, again, I will emphasize the word free. Um, if you go on their website at the top in the middle, there's a section that talks about social skills um, and free social skills research uh, or resources, I'm sorry. And that's really where you'll find some of these um, types of examples. You can walk through and look at all of that um, on your own time. But specifically, one of the things they emphasize is that cognitive behavioral interventions are exceptionally helpful for teaching social skills. So that definitely goes into some of our other evidence-based practices as well. This particular example is one about we had a um, they had a child that you know you may have a child that says things without thinking first and so obviously they become socially isolated because they don't make the best choices when saying things like that so you can teach them um, to categorize things by putting them into piles you can cut these um, statements into sentence strips and have them put you know the left hand side of the table if you think they need to filter it and on the right hand side if they it, that it would be okay to say. So again, some of those things, and, and maybe taking those specific examples. You know, um, I think all of our kids, um, for those of us that are parents, have said, you know, I hate you, or I don't want you to be my mom anymore, or you don't love me, and they get a reaction out of us, and so they're therefore reinforced um, in their minds, and so they pull those out of their pockets and they play that card when they know that we're the most vulnerable. And so that's what our kids with autism do too. If they see other kids or adults get a reaction and they get a reaction from that, then they kind of make a mental note in my head, yep, I'm going to use that again. So for a lot of our students, those types of statements and those types of behaviors have been reinforced for a really long time. And we may not have meant to have reinforced those, but they have been. So we have to go back and reteach those and say, you know, those are words that hurt. And let's come out with a different way that we can, might be able to say that uh, for you to communicate your frustration or your disappointment without necessarily using ugly words. So that's what they've done here. 
It's just what could you filter and what could you say it. And the way that you can kind of help generalize that um, to a different setting is once you've done this in a small, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one situation where you've actually practiced this skill, you can literally have just the words or the visual cues, you know, filter it or say it, you know, post it on, you know, their desk or on the wall, or, you know, if you're at home, maybe have those sticking on a magnet on your refrigerator so that you can reference it. And once they say something, instead of going, hey, you don't need to say that, that was mean, stop for a minute and say, all right, think about what you just said. Do you think that that would be something that should go in the filter it or something that should go in the say it column? And if it should go in the filter it, what's another way that we can say that same thing to get your point across? So again, you know, using that as a teaching moment in that natural environment is really going to get you far. And then you're reinforcing instead and providing them with positive attention for the replacement behavior that you're teaching them. And I know that sounds really good in theory and that's more difficult to implement. Um, like Dee told you earlier, I've worked in the home, in the community, the mental health types of settings as well as the school settings. Um, and was even pretty much a nanny to a younger child with autism um, in my younger years. So I kind of understand the complexities of how easy that sounds, but how difficult that might be to implement, especially when they're pressing buttons. Here's another example of a, a visual way to provide them um, support. And this would be a strategy that we might want to consider when we're talking about personal space. Um, we get lots of phone calls at the center about kids that might get in trouble for hitting behaviors or not understanding personal boundaries and how that might impact them, you know, even in the workforce as they get older. So sometimes they don't realize where they're standing. And I mentioned earlier, you know, a concept about using a space ruler. You know, that was a concrete way to define space in between one person and another. You know, in schools, you might hear them now talk about, you know, you have to walk so many blocks away from the wall, you know, using the tiles on the floor. So a very concrete visual skill. And this kind of does the same exact thing that you can individualize it. You might um, print this and have the arrow um, where it's movable and attach that with a brad. And so therefore, um, in different situations, you could role play with them. You know, this is too far away from others when you're talking to them, or you're almost close enough, or oh my goodness, that you're way too close. So you can kind of play a game with this um, and even do that um, in the confines with their peers also so that they can kind of get an idea about, you know, what is an okay range to be. So again, being able to use that, maybe taping it to the front of a folder if you're walking in the hallway at school. Or um, I've had parents that, you know, if they had a communication notebook, they might put this on the back of their notebook and kind of use that as a guide or something similar to that to be able to whip out and say, hey, listen, where are you standing right now? And just by using that own verbal prompt, then you're teaching them to be able to recognize and go, oh, I'm too many steps close to them. So you can take a step back. The same exact things can happen when you're trying to, uh, or the same strategy could work when you're trying to teach words um, or environments. And for most of us here in Kentucky, we've grown up in the Bible Belt. So I think about the example of, um, you know, church when we were younger. And we all got the look is kind of what we call it. You know, your parents gave you that glaring look as you um, sat down the pew from them. And so at a very, very early age that you started to understand that there were certain behaviors that were okay in some environments and not okay in other environments. And so um, sometimes that's a little bit more concrete or abstract to teach. So this might be a more concrete way and a visual way in order to do that. So it might be that it's, you know, we're at the playground or the pool um, or we're outside playing with our friends, so it's okay to be silly and playful. Or we can be playful, but just not silly. Or now is the time that we need to be calm and polite and focus our attention. Or we need to be serious and very polite. Like in the example, um, I had a parent that called me that said their child was telling jokes from an, a joke book or knock-knock jokes at a, um, at a funeral parlor um, for a family member that had passed. And that was just a really difficult concept for her to try to tell her son that that wasn't an appropriate time. So this might be a good visual reminder um, or support in place in which you could practice and role play that. 
Um, we also know that carrying on conversations with um, their peers and other adults um, and sticking to the topics and being able to initiate and end a conversation is very difficult. So this is another example in which you might want to practice and role play. The end goal might be carrying on a three exchange conversation with a new person that you didn't know. So these could be some questions of things that you might ask. Um, some compliments that you might want to give to them, or just some friendly comments that you might need to make in order to kind of keep that conversation going. And as we said earlier, our learners are very concrete and it's very literal, so if you can actually give them the words um, when we're, they're in that situation, then that can definitely help. So as you can see, a lot of the examples I've showed you so far are very visual in nature. And when you look at the research, that's what the research supports, is that sometimes the auditory processing component or their ability to understand um, auditory language or spoken language is difficult for them. So putting it in a frame that they can understand and relate to that's very visual. So some of our kids need extra processing times when we give them auditory information. So making it visual, they can make it take as much time to process that information as they need to. So they can also carry that over and it really helps for generalization purposes also. So again, another resource that I'm going to share with you is the Incredible Five Point Scale. Um, this is by Carrie Dunn Baron, and she has some wonderful materials out there um, that you can really adapt, um, not just for kids with autism, um, but kids with a variety um, of strengths and weaknesses. And so what she does is she kind of puts emotions and social situations um, into a visual frame of reference. So you know, it, it, was, it was in and again, she focused on how would you teach social understanding you know, to students with autism, um, or even I think she focused on fetal alcohol syndrome, children diagnosed with that as well. Um, and since 2003, they've learned a lot more about why the scale works and how you could use it in a variety of other settings, so I'm going to show you some examples. And obviously the primary goal of this scale is to help those students notice and respond to their own behavior and then also recognize the social behaviors of others so that they can ultimately pick up on that. So again, referencing back to our cognitive behavioral intervention definition, it does just that, right? Examine our own thoughts and behaviors and then figure out how, recognize that those are probably not bad, but maybe ineffective and that there's more appropriate strategies out there. So to teach what I can do in those situations instead. So again, teaching these um, skills in an, you know, a concrete and a systematic and a non-judgmental way that you can definitely reference or categorize or compartmentalize in an easier fashion. So things even like self-regulation skills, you know, teaching kids to self-monitor or take the perspective of others. You know, you hear a lot about what we call theory of mind, which is just a fancy way of saying perspective taking. You know, how do you be empathetic or sim sympathetic to other people? So by doing that and teaching them to self-regulate or recognize their own behaviors, you're actually teaching independence. So that's a really good um, focal point, especially when we talk to parents and providers that are more interested in long-term outcomes. So the five-point scale definitely makes things predictable, and it teaches us a way to problem-solve through some of those behaviors and troubleshoot maybe past behaviors and then figure out what are we going to do in the future when this behavior happens again so that we can better create a plan for how we're going to deal and self-manage ourselves. So again, the strength is to promote generalization um, across environments and to teach them to be able to do this on their own so that they can do it without an adult present. And again, while I haven't reemphasized this, or I haven't emphasized this, I want to reemphasize how important it is to know that these concepts and strategies can be used with verbal and nonverbal students. Just because they may not have expressive language doesn't mean that they lack the cognitive ability or the ability to problem solve through and understand and learn in this manner um, through this methodology. And also, we talked about being able to teach this in steps that are manageable for other people. So specifically with the incredible five-point scale, it breaks a concept or a behavior down into five concrete levels. And I will say that you can also, for younger learners, or you, know, you can alter it to maybe only be two steps uh, or two levels or three levels that um, is differentiated also. So 
eventually you're going to get to the point where you can come to a mutual agreement about, okay, a five looks like this or a four looks like this. And if you think about it, this concept has actually been around for a while because if you go to a hospital setting, they'll say, you know, on a pain, of, on a pain scale of one to ten, with ten being the most excruciating pain you've ever felt, where would you rate your pain today? So they really use that for effective pain management. So um, a lot of these strategies, if you use that, can also kind of morph over and be generalized to other settings that would be helpful in helping those individuals also. So one way that you might use this type of scale is when you're talking about voice levels, whether that be in a classroom or Walmart or um, you know a doctor's office type of setting. So you know they don't recognize that they're at a level five type of screaming behavior, um, and when it would be okay to use those. So in an emergency only, you know a four might be that it's okay to be loud and silly and playing outside. So you might use that at recess. Another example would be maybe for anger or anxiety. If you can tell that, you know, in this particular example, they've taken a student and paired a picture with what, you know, this is what a five looks like, this is what a three looks like, and this is what a one looks like, so that you can do a better job at being able to educate that kid on, you know, where their emotions are, even if they can't read their own facial expressions. Hopefully by presenting it this way, they'll be able to kind of make that association and then ultimately gain a different coping strategy and use a different coping strategy instead of the one that they see in the picture. So again, it might be that you have a stress scale. Um, I might need one of these um, on my, my computer laptop for my own um, usage some days. Um, a five means I can lose control and I really need a break. A four might mean that it can really upset me, but I can still use you know, this tool to get through it. Or three, it might make me nervous, or it might bug me a little, or one, it doesn't bother me at all and I'm just fine. So if you think about it, we all do this on a daily basis. When we get up in the morning, you can kind of say, oh, wow, today's going to be a really rough day. I spilled my coffee in the parking lot. I got a speeding ticket on the way to work. So you kind of know that those external factors can drive and impact where you are on that scale at any time. You can also use this when you're teaching, um, like I said earlier, those um, appropriate words that you might use in a situation. So these are threatening words and those are not appropriate. You know, it's not okay to say, I'm going to kill you um, to someone when you get angry. So it's okay to be angry, but we choose different ways to, to communicate that. This is also taking this a step further. It's not just being able to identify that, you know, a five looks like this, um, you know, with a picture, but taking it a step further to maybe be able to describe what that behavior looks like and then ultimately what it feels like and then what I can try to do instead, you know, when I get to that point. So an example, sorry, went the other wrong way, might be this. This might be a self-management skill for a student. A fine five means... Um, what does it look like? It looks like being in a tidal wave, screaming and maybe throwing things. And when I'm in a five, I don't hear people talking to me. So what are some situations that might make me feel this way? Nothing is working. I'm out of control. I can't think. You know, and if, with a four, it might be that somebody says something that makes me angry. Um, it might be that, you know, somebody disrupted my routine. And then that far right column is, you know, what can I do now? So when I get to that five, do I, can I close my eyes and count to ten, or is that only going to be a strategy that works when I'm at a level three behavior? And one of the big questions, you know, both that we get from providers, families, um, and other professionals, but also that I struggle with is, well, how do you even get to this point? You know, how do you get to the point where you know what a five is or a four is so that you can actually work through some of that? So sometimes it can be really helpful to present it in this way so that the individual can actually fill in their own words and have ownership of that and draw their own pictures. Now to us, those pictures may not look like it's a representation of anything um, or that there may only be subtle differences, but to the kid with autism, they definitely know and, and can, can kind of attribute those feelings to being different and categorizing them um, in each of those categories. This is a way that you might be able to visually represent it differently to where you can um, post on a, um, on, on a poster in the classroom or um, I've had parents that keep these on a clipboard in the car. 
Um, I got permission actually to use this from um, a kiddo that I've come in contact with and a mother that works closely with us here at KATC. And her little boy's name is Jasper, and he is in kindergarten this year. He has a ton of behavioral supports in the home. Um, he has supports in school, and he has some of the greatest parents ever in terms of understanding and buying into how important this intervention is um, across the board, no matter what setting they're in, and community providers. So what they did is they made their own little thermometer because he understood that concept. And so instead of labeling it with a five or a four or three or what have you, they broke it down into color categories and used and referenced that and assigned a, a picture um, to demonstrate what that emotion looks like. So this is Jasper, and what Jasper has is these um, pictures of him are removable on Velcro or on magnets, and so he might have this thermometer um, on the fridge, or you can use a cookie sheet that's mobile with you, um, and then you can have these magnets and just print those from your computer or get that done at you know Staples or Office Depot. And then what would happen is, is that he could actually put his picture over here where he is feeling and then can kind of move that up. Now, very obviously, you can tell that with Jasper, he's only five, so that can be a really hard concept. So in the very beginning, it completely and totally was an adult intervention. Mom might say, wow, Jasper, you look like you're very angry. Let's put Jasper in the red zone. Or, man, you look like you're getting a little upset. Maybe we should go here. And so initially it was just simply labeling that emotion, just like we typically would do um, you know, with a typically developing toddler when they're throwing a tantrum. You are mad, and that's okay. So you're going to label that for them. So for them, for Jasper, they took it um, a little one step further, and this particular chart here was actually for the providers. So when they were modeling and putting Jasper's picture over here um, in the red part of the thermometer, they're saying, oh, this is where he's getting the physical aggression and he's repeated screaming. So we have operationally defined that that is what a red behavior is. So again, over here to the right, we know exactly what that is. And then it kind of gives you an outline as to, all right, what are we going to do? So you know, for him, if it's possible for him to you know, walk to his bedroom or to give him some time, you know, help him get there. And then before we talk with him again, we have to wait till he's been quiet for at least one minute before we go in. So as you can see, it kind of outlines what that behavior looks like. And it can even go so far as to say, okay, when you do go, do go in to intervene with him, here's specifically what you say. You say, when Jasper is calm, you have a calm body and a calm voice. We need to pick an option to finish calming down. Do you want to pick yellow or do you want X? So what you see that we're doing is that we're modeling and we're being consistent so that we can ultimately analyze his thoughts and emotions and then provide him or prompt him and reinforce him to use the appropriate replacement behaviors. So ultimately what we want Jasper to do is to be able to put his own picture on that scale by recognizing his emotions. So now he's gotten to the point where he wants to calm down and he needs to calm down. So coming up with things, you know, what, what can I do when I'm at a red or what can I do when I'm at an orange or what can I do with yellow and green? So it might be helpful to come up with something like this that would be a choice board. So it's when I, you know, what's going to help you feel better? So if you can see that you match the picture of the frazzled individual, to what that picture of this frazzled individual looks like when we're in the orange. So you might have you know, a red sheet, and if you notice, the color coding is different because this was for a different student, but it gives you kind of a frame of reference of what that might look like. The other reference I'd like to throw out there to you is the um, same author as um, Carrie Dunbaron. She came up with um, a five could make me lose control. And what it is is it is a very um, formal system that pairs this color coding system with a visual face. And it comes with cards, and it comes with some pre-made cards that you definitely can make your own. And it's a time that, again, is preventative that you would sit down with the individual and talk about some situations that might be anxiety-provoking for them or that they lack social skills or those um, skills needed to be able to be successful. So this is, um, I conducted a training a while back, and I did a make and take with family so that they can make their own because not all of us have those resources. So this is just simply um, two file folders that are taped together, and these are construct different colored construction paper um, that are in there. These are pockets that you get. You could even um, go ask your local library if maybe they still have some that goes in the front of the books. They're just adhesive that you stick on. 
And you can label them one, two, three, four, or five. And over here you can kind of see that there's a, some examples of things, um, some of the pictures. Some of them come with pictures, some of them are just written examples. So it might be, um, I'm asked to work in a group setting. If I'm asked to do that, then I know that's going to be a five. Um, what about a bus evacuation drill? Well, those make me really nervous, so let's put those here. So this would kind of be a stepping stone is to figure out how am I going to get um, to the point where I can start learning what some of these five, four, three, two, one behaviors look like. And really through working with individuals, you'd be amazed because the things that we as adults sometimes feel like would definitely be a five, um, they might only recognize as being a three. And things that we didn't even realize were on the radar, they might actually be coded as a five. And again, just keeping in mind that these things can change over time or based on, you know, the kind of day or what side of the bed you wake up on in the morning. So just knowing that they're not completely and totally um, concrete. So again, these are only a few of the cognitive-based interventions um, and ways of thinking through cognitive-based intervention, but I wanted to give you some specific examples that you could take away definitely today to try. Um, you know, cognitive behavior therapy in general can be, you know, in college is a whole long, you know, course load, um, a, a whole semester long or even, you know, multiple semesters of this particular type of therapy background. So again, this is only a few ways in order to be able to do that. So at this time, I'd like to open the floor to some questions. And let me switch over to see if there's any listed. Um, Dee, I'm not seeing any questions. Are you seeing anything that maybe I'm not seeing? No, I don't see any questions. No, I don't see any questions. Well, I'm going to give you a few minutes. Um, I'll stay on the line. And if anybody has any questions, I'll just give you time to kind of type those out, and I will definitely address those. Um, we're about 50 minutes in, so I'll continue to stay on um, until I start to see people kind of dropping off. And copies of the slides, were sent, the slides out were sent out yesterday and this morning, but if you haven't received any, haven't received just any. let me know and I'll, send you, and I'll send you another copy. And also I want to give a shout out to Jasper's mom for giving me um, permission to show his examples because I really feel like that it's really helpful, at least for me, to be able to see how this is working, you know, with specific individuals. So just want to say thank you to her. I think she might be listening, so thank you. And for anyone that was having problems, that was having problems downloading the copy downloading of the, the email of today, the email today um, it was attached um, to a link. I can send you the actual PowerPoint. Not PowerPoint, but the PDF of the PowerPoint. And I think the reason why it was so difficult to send is because I did include so many examples of the visuals. And so it was kind of a struggle to be able to email that to get it onto the server to use um, for that reason. I had a question just posted that says, some of the ideas that you use for the five-point scale, are they available somewhere to refer back to? Um, yes, they actually are. If you actually will just type in Google um, to um, the five-point scale, you can actually go on, and she now has posted um, nicely some blank copies of that 54321 um, with those color coding, so you can actually even print your own. It does have some of those examples that I shared with you on her website. Um, again, some of these are more special. Some of the examples I used specifically with Jasper were more individualized for him. So if you're needing some more information, um, you can definitely email me. My email address, I just realized, is not on the PowerPoint. Um, it is michelle.antle, that's A-N-T-L-E, at louisville.edu.
Okay, I don't see any other okay, questions. I don't see any other questions. I don't either. Okay. I appreciate everybody spending your morning with us. And um, if we can help you in any way, please just contact us.